OK, so it's two o'clock. Um, you're all very welcome. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, registering for the latest Irish Wildlife Trust uh, webinar. Uh, we have a very exciting topic for you today, and uh, we have some very exciting speakers for you today also. Um, if you're new to the Irish Wildlife Trust, we are a national Irish non-governmental organisation. And uh, we see it as our job to raise awareness of the importance uh, of nature to people. Uh, so we do a lot of ad advocacy work in terms of policy and public awareness of the importance of nature to all of our lives. If you want to help the Irish Wildlife Trust, please consider uh, joining uh, our organisation and do log on to iwt.ie where you will find all of the details. So today we're going to talk about uh, the fascinating topic of nature-based solutions. And we have two great speakers for you today. And our first uh, speaker is coming to us from uh, London. Natalie Seddon is Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Oxford and Director of the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative, an interdisciplinary program of research, policy, advice and education aimed at increasing understanding of the effectiveness of nature-based solutions to global challenges. After training as an evolutionary ecologist at Cambridge University, she developed broad research interests in understanding the origins and maintenance of biodiversity and its relationship with global change. She is a senior associate at the International Institute for Environment and Development and a senior fellow at the Oxford Martin School. Natalie advises governments, UN agencies and businesses on nature-based solutions and is a friend of COP26, that is the big meeting on climate change which is going to happen next year, and is one of 28 global experts currently advising the UK governments uh, on the COP next year. And I first came across Natalie's name uh, in a paper that uh, she co-authored for um, Nature, the prestigious journal Nature, about uh, nature-based solutions and particularly some of the pitfalls uh, that we can encounter. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Natalie, I can invite you to share your screen with us. Hello. Hi, um, it's a tremendous pleasure to be taking part in this uh, webinar. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I have the great honor now to discuss some of the opportunities and risks of uh, nature-based solutions to both the causes and also the impacts of climate change. Firstly, I'd like to do this in a global context, but then I want to end by discussing what this might mean uh, for Ireland. So as you're all aware, no doubt, the evidence is very clear. You know, not only are we failing to stabilize the climate or stem the tide of biodiversity loss, but these failures are increasing poverty and equality around the world and are severely undermining the, um, the development gains of the 20th century. And as all the evidence builds that humanity is uh, driving the state of natural systems on which it depends beyond the point of no return, it is becoming clear that much larger scale and much more coherent approaches to tackling global challenges are really needed. So it's sort of against this backdrop. Um, well, one such family of approaches uh, are that have recently risen in prominence on both the political and business agendas, the so-called nature-based solutions. Now, put very simply, these involve working with and enhancing nature to address a wide range of societal goals, from greenhouse gas reduction to erosion control, coastal defence, um, and all sorts of other, other societal benefits. And the concept is grounded in the robust scientific knowledge that very healthy, biodiverse ecosystems produce a wide diversity of services on which human well-being and sustainable development ultimately depends. Um, and they involve, um, you know, actions that involve the protection of uh, ecosystems, the restoration or management of them, the sustainable management of working lands such as croplands and timberlands, or the creation of novel e ecosystems in and around cities or across the wider landscape. Um, and nature-based solutions is an important concept because it represents uh, quite a new framing of our relationship with nature. Rather than regarding natural ecosystems as being purely vulnerable to human activities, um, they are instead recognised as a major ally in the fight against global change. And one of the, the key aspects of this, and one of the reasons this has sort of become much more uh, prominent in, in discourse, in policy discourse, in business discourse, it's, it's there is this growing understanding that things like biodiversity loss and climate change share some of the same drivers and hence must have some of the same solutions. 
So in particular, land use change is both the biggest driver of biodiversity declines across the globe, accounting for around 30%, and the second biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for 23%. So addressing land use change through nature-based solutions can, in theory, therefore, both slow warming, help us adapt to climate change, and of course, arrest biodiversity declines. Declines, But of course, the extent to which nature can bring all these benefits depends very much on how we implement them, how we invest in nature based solutions. So There is a lot of evidence, there's growing evidence that, for example, protecting grasslands, wetlands and forests in our catchments can secure and regulate water supply while also shielding communities and infrastructure from floods, erosion and landslides. There is also growing evidence that restoring coastal wetlands and reefs can protect against storm surges and erosion, improved management of working lands can stabilise or enhance crop yields in much more drier and more variable climates, and that the creation of new ecosystems, such as green infrastructure in our cities, can help with cooling and flood abatement, whilst reducing air pollution and providing lots of mental, very well documented mental and physical health benefits. In other words, nature-based solutions can support human adapt adaptation to climate change and protect biodiversity. And there's growing evidence now, much of it being collated over the last few months actually, that um, these benefits can be achievable at a relatively low cost and can often stimulate recovery, economic recovery. And I'll get back to that important point in a bit. So in terms of examples, more uh, local examples, um, there are you know, dozens and dozens of um, nature-based solutions being implemented, well hundreds been implemented across the globe and many and many have been implemented in ecosystems local in, in, in the UK. For example, we have um, a tree planting and river rewilding project in the Lake District. So in this project, which was um, has been implemented through the Sustainable Catchment Management Programme of the United Utilities, working with local farmers and the RSPB, this has involved the planting of 150,000 uh, native trees in Horsewater Reserve and a river rewiggled or rewilded in the Swindale Valley. And what this program has, has been shown to benefit, um, not only the flow um, of water, so some evidence that it's helping with flood mitigation, but it's also improving water quality, it's very good for biodiversity, and the tree planting is um, beginning to enhance carbon storage and sequestration um, across the landscape. And one critical aspect of this project is that the hill farms are being run as a viable businesses in this context. There's also examples of restoring natural grassland, for example, in the South Downs in England. So this was a restoration of a natural grassland from a winter cereal field. This has protected a housing estate from muddy floods for over 20 years. And it does this by lowering flood risk, by reducing the area contributing to runoff and by stopping valley floors uh, linking up, the flow through the valley floors linking up. And then another project fairly recently established is the Ken Scorn Connect project in Scotland. Now this is a really interesting project. It's a partnership of neighbouring land managers committed to a very ambitious 200 year landscape scale plan over an area of 600 uh, kilometres square. This is involving restoring watercourses and floodplains, restoring ancient and native woodlands, restructuring of the pine plantations and restoring blanket box. And this is four of these activities are forecast to reju reduce flood risk quite significantly, draw down and store carbon over the long term, of course, protect wildlife, protect biodiversity, as well as creating a beautiful and important place for people to visit. So those are some more local examples. Now, one of the key things about nature-based solutions is they do actually make a lot of economic um, sense. So um, there's been lots of global analyses demonstrating this quite clearly, for example, the benefits of mangrove restoration, those benefits include fisheries, forestry, disaster risk reduction, recreation and so forth. Those benefits are up to 10 times the costs of implementation. So that was some work conducted by the Global Commission for Adaptation. Um, meanwhile, another study has showed that nature-based coastal defence projects are up to five times more cost effective compared to the more traditional engineered structures. And in the USA, every year during the hurricane season, salt marshes can protect around 23 billion US dollars worth of property and infrastructure. Um, each year during the hurricane season. And um, it's also been shown that if we're, were we to um, uh, lose all our reefs globally, that the annual damaging, damages from flooding would double and costs from storms would triple. 
Um, there's also growing evidence that uh, nature-based solutions can stimulate the, the economy. And obviously this is very important um, at this time as we try and manage and then recover from the, the pandemic. And so one study showed that in the USA for every $1 million invested in coastal habitat restoration, 40 new jobs were created compared to 19 for investment in the aviation industry, seven for finance, and critically only five for oil and gas. Meanwhile, the uh, Food and Land Use Coalition recently published a report showing that new invest investment of around 350 billion US dollars a year in sustainable food and land use systems could create over 120 million jobs and around four and a half trillion US dollars in business opportunities that could be generated globally each year by 2030. So those are very powerful figures. Now, of course, um, you know, if actions are properly implemented, they can also help mitigate climate change by protecting or enhancing carbon sinks whilst reducing emissions, emissions from land use and sea use change. So as you know, you know, ecosystems on land and also in the sea, we must never forget about the marine environment when we have these discussions. These play a critical role in the global carbon cycle. So agriculture, forestry and other land use activities account for around 13% of um, carbon dioxide emissions, um, while the land sink can absorb around 29% and the ocean sink around 24% of carbon dioxide emissions, anthropogenic emissions. But the biosphere has potential to remove and store considerably more um, were nature-based solutions to be scaled up to the maximum extent. Now, of course, estimating the mitigation potential of nature-based solutions, as you can imagine, is technically very complicated. Estimates are highly dependent on assumptions regarding future trends in the land use sector, demand and supply, the carbon saturation point of ecosystems, the price of carbon plays a very important role. And there are also many issues around the constraints on where and how you implement nature-based solutions, including their economic and political feasibility, important issues around land rights and tenure need to be considered, as well as safeguards for food security and biodiversity. And of course, the elephant in the room, whenever we talk about nature-based solutions, is the fact that you know, climate change itself really has a, a very severe impact on the health and functionality of the ecosystems and their capacity to, to draw down and store carbon. Now, this is a very active area of research, of course, very important area of research. Lots of work is being conducted to refine estimates and the models are improving all the time. Now, some of the best and most influential work um, which has been led by somebody called Bronson Griscom, who works at the conservation organization, Conservation International. Um, he recently teamed up with colleagues here in Oxford, um, and I wanted to, to generate some new estimates using a quite you know, well-constrained model that took into account many of the assumptions that I just mentioned. Um, and it, we, in this study, we have estimated that if we were to scale up nature-based solutions to the maximum extent possible, then we can reduce the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, by around 10 gigatons um, per year. And these estimates suggest that the most significant contributions for cost-effective avoided emissions comes from protecting intact ecosystems. And I'll get back to the importance of intact ecosystems. Managing working lands such as croplands and timberlands can also can provide the greatest contribution to the global sink, followed by restoring native cover. So protected areas are very important to shield intact ecosystems from human influence, and this can play a role. And intact ecosystems are much, store much more carbon and are actually more resilient in the face of climate extremes and pathogens because they're more diverse. Um, so on the basis of this figure of 10 gigatons, a powerful statement regarding nature-based solutions has been circulating in business and policy uh, discourse, and that is that nature-based solutions have the potential to provide around 30% of the cost-effective carbon dioxide mitigation that we need through to 2030 to keep warming to less than two degrees. However, um, it's vitally important to understand that this potential can only be achieved in tandem with rapid and aggressive decarbonisation of the global economy. In other words, you can't have your 30% without also having the 70% through decarbonisation. So we need to decarbonise and scale up nature-based solutions. It's not an e either or. They can't be um, uh, you know, used as a replacement. Nature-based solutions can't be used as a replacement for decarbonisation, and I'll get back to that. So as a result of all the, the growing evidence and awareness of the potential of nature-based solutions for addressing the climate change crisis, whilst also addressing biodiversity loss, nature-based solutions uh, have been gaining a lot of traction in recent years. And over the last 12 months, dozens of pledges and new funding streams for nature-based solutions have been announced by countries and companies. Um, 
recently um, 76 nations signed the Leaders Pledge, which has been led by the UK, the Leaders Pledge for Nature. And this was launched at the very first United Nations Summit on Biodiversity just a few weeks ago in September. And these signatories of this pledge have committed to cooperating with each other and holding one another to account in their joint mission to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. Now, while such commitments are really encouraging and these may represent a significant shift in business and government, very few pledges for nature define clear and actionable plans for implementing and verifying the commitments. You know, and although well-designed nature-based solutions, as I've argued, can deliver multiple benefits for people in nature, as you're probably aware, much of the recent limelight has been very narrowly focused on tree planting as a silver bullet climate solution. You know, but tree planting, especially afforestation, so the planting of trees on um, uh, naturally treeless environments, uh, such as peat bogs, um, is actually a very small part of the climate solution. And as I say, only works in tandem with strict decarbonisation. And it's as real concerns that this focus on afforestation um, is distracting from the need to decarbonise and the need to protect intact ecosystems. And serious concerns that, um, you know, the expansion of forestry framed as a climate change mitigation solution um, is really compromising um, um, climate ambition um, and leading to uh, the loss of biodiverse native ecosystems. So, um, you know, a forest is not a crop of trees and a crop of trees is not a climate solution. You know, trees are incredibly important. Um, you know, they regulate our water cycles, they bind our soils and slopes, they support lots, they support lots of di diversity, you know, from nutrient cycling microbes to animals that pollinate and disperse the seeds. But the tree's capacity to perform all these important functions um, depends on the overall health of the ecosystem and the resilience of the ecosystem in which they grow. So healthy, intact, biodiverse ecosystems are part of the climate solutions, but crops of trees, monoculture plantations, commercial forestry just is not a climate solution it needs to be um you know it's very important that people realize this we need plantations to supply wood but they're not um climate solutions um so um and they're not climate solutions partly because you know uh, they only offer very short-term high-risk carbon stores because much of the harvester's wood is for short-lived products they're also you know low in diversity often single species or very low numbers of species non-native species are used and these plantations in that they're low because they have low biodiversity are also very uh, vulnerable to new pests and pathogens and diseases um, the other problems with the focus on afforestation as a climate solution is that critically important habitats are threatened, um, such as wetlands, peatlands, about which I'm going to talk some more in a minute, natural grasslands. I mean, these are really rich in carbon, really important for biodiversity, very important often in terms of regulating water supplies and flood mitigation. And often these ecosystems are actually being damaged or replaced by um, afforestation, and this can lead to a net loss of biodiversity and carbon. Um, and there are examples all over the world, for example, a recently published study on Chile showed that the area of plantation forest had almost doubled between 1986 and 2011. Carbon storage had actually only increased by about 2% during this period, but the native Nothofagus forest shrunk by 13%. And subsidies, government subsidies, accelerated this um, biodiversity loss for very little carbon gain. And similar stories all over the world, another study um, on Cambodia, there was a three, 34,000 hectare concession that was um, dedicated for climate change mitigation. It involved converting species rich tropical rainforest into an acacia monoculture, terrible for biodiversity, terrible for carbon, and also it was awful for the local communities who were disp dis dispossessed from the land. So all these sorts of concerns um, really speak to the need to have clear guidelines and standards around what we mean by good nature-based solutions. And I think it's really important to, you know, for business leaders, policymakers, and practitioners um, in Ireland and across the globe to consider these four guiding principles. Um, and I will talk about these generally and then talk about what this might mean for Ireland in particular. So these are the four guidelines we actually um, a large group of UK-based organisations put together these guidelines and wrote them in a letter to 
um, Alok Sharma at the beginning of the year when he became or his position as the COP26 president was announced. Um, and these are that nature-based solutions are a vitally important part of the climate solution, but are not a substitute for rapid fossil fuel phase out and must not delay urgent action to decarbonize the economy. Crucially, any funding for nature-based solutions from offsetting must come only from those entities that have these very credible and ambitious net zero plans. The second guideline is that um, nature-based solutions must involve the protection and restoration of a wide range of naturally occurring intact ecosystems on land and in the sea and improve management of working lands. They need to be implemented with the full consent and engagement of local communities, of course, especially including farmers. And um, nature-based solutions must sustain or even enhance the diversity of native species and habitats because this is what gives them the resilience um, to be able to deal with the impacts of climate change and continue to provide benefits uh, to society into the future. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, home in on the local context, what might, might, what might this all mean for Ireland? How do these four guidelines translate into policy and action here? So there were key eight um, action points, I think, that um, um, we might want to consider. Um, one is, of course, to decarbonise. Legally binding, uh, binding island-specific emission reduction car uh, targets are very important to drive ambitious action in transport agriculture and energy, where most of the greenhouse gases come from, um, and also in sustainable land management. Um, key uh, to a nature-based solutions ambition in Ireland would be protecting the remaining areas of intact ecosystems. And very important in Ireland are your peatlands, but you also have important native woodlands, grasslands, and in the marine environment, your kelp forests, your seagrass meadows are also vitally important stores of carbon and provide habitat for biodiversity and also provide coastal resilience and of course salt marshes are also important um, in this uh, in this context and ensuring that these are protected buffered and connected with one another is very very important um, it's also important to restore the ecosystems that have been degraded degraded ecosystems are much poorer at storing and um, drawing down carbon and, and are much less valuable in terms of biodiversity and a range of other benefits and when we think about restoration it's important to focus on re natural regeneration the science is very clear that these bring the greatest benefits over the long term to society and wildlife um, uh, it's important also to create green infrastructure in schools, towns and cities. There's so much evidence now that this really helps to support mental and physical benefits, especially for young people. Um, it's critical to avoid tree plantations on natural ecosystems. It's also critical to mobilise public and private finance for nature-based solutions. And I'll say it again, ensuring that funding schemes reward not just the carbon benefits, but also the biodiversity. It's important to reward based on, on benefits for both those things. We need to monitor and evaluate the benefits of nature-based solutions over time to ensure that they have sustained benefits for people in nature. And of course, incredibly important to communicate the societal benefits of nature-based solutions, including for public health. So communication um, and buy-in from the general public and stakeholders in general is incredibly important. So I wanted to just end with a couple of slides focusing on peatlands because these are very important um, ecosystems, very extensive um, in your country. Globally, they're actually one of the most valuable ecosystems. They are critical for, for preserving rich biodiversity, uh, providing clean water, flood mitigation risk, and so forth. They're also really vital for climate regulation. Actually, peatlands across the world uh, cover over 3 million kilometres squared, and they are the largest natural terrestrial store of carbon. So it's really important that that carbon stays locked up within these ecosystems. And in fact, damaged peatlands are one of the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions, contributing to 6% of global carbon dioxide emissions. Now, Ireland is one of the largest areas of intact uh, blanket bogs in Europe, but this is really threatened by plantations, conifer plantations, drainage, overgrazing, extraction, and so forth. And if you were to protect your peatlands more effectively, more extensively, this would help Ireland meet its climate and biodiversity commitments, whilst also supporting climate change adaptation. So it's sort of very general, I think more specifically, there are some key things that would really help um, with this. 
the banning of burning and tree planting on peatlands is obviously an important one, the banning of extraction and the sale of peat for horticulture, and also, whilst also ensuring uh, that you avoid the offshore offshoring the markets. Um, committed, dedicated long-term funding for restoration, including the removal of conifer plantations through, for example, payment for ecosystem servicing through robust offsetting schemes and so forth. Um, a fourth uh, key action would be prohibiting new extraction permissions. Um, a fifth one would be, and this is vitally important, reforming land management subsidies um, to encourage the effective management of peatlands. And finally, to invest in the monitoring and evaluation of projects to ensure sustained benefits. So to end, I just wanted to say that working with nature and being careful stewardships, stewards of our ecosystems is vitally important and is absolutely fundamental to creating healthy, flourishing societies and businesses. You know, so it shouldn't be seen as a sole responsibility of the conservation community, but in fact, all our responsibilities. Nature is after all our life support system and we ignore it or we undervalue it at our peril. And the evidence for that has never been clearer. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie. That's a really, a really fascinating overview, and it always astounds me. You know the real potential uh, in this uh, area that uh, you know we we struggle to to uh, tap into. I think you know. I mean, anybody from from Ireland and certainly fans of the Irish Wildlife Trust will will know about all about monoculture, forestry, and plantations on peatlands and uh, and uh, and that disaster zone, uh, which we'll probably come back to in the in the Q and A. Just for the attendees, please. Um, two things. Just note that if you have a question, please put it into the Q and A box. Uh, and also, there's a few people asking if the slides will be will be uh, available afterwards. The entire uh, webinar will be on our YouTube channel uh, later in the week, so we will post a link to that in due course. So our next speaker uh, is uh, Jennifer Whitmore. Jennifer is a TD for Wicklow and is the Social Democrat spokesperson on climate communications networks, biodiversity, children equality and integration. Jennifer spent 10 years in Australia where she worked as a senior policy analyst alongside government ministers developing environmental law, water management and energy policy. And in Ireland, Jennifer has worked extensively in fisheries and aquaculture. And I think I remember her telling me she worked on turbot research in Norway at one point as well. I don't think we have too many politicians who can put that on their CV. Uh, so welcome, Jennifer. And uh, uh, in your own time, you can share your screen. Thank you very much, Pork. And Natalie, thank you very much. That was a really interesting presentation. I think we might have to catch up after this uh, after this talk as well. So yes, I, I worked on, um, it was a halibut farm, halibut research okay. farm in Norway. Yeah, um, it was certainly a, a good way to spend a few months getting knocked over by big halibut in, uh, in the tanks. But um, I'm just going to share the screen now. So, um, so as as Paul said, I'm, I'm a TD now. So I started off in, in the area of environment and uh, ecology and worked uh, with the Marine Institute. And then when I moved over to Australia, I worked in the area of primarily water management. We, we initiated uh, new legislation over there that looked at water resources and how you share them equally between, or not equally, but share them between different water users, including the environment. But I also did some time over there um, working with in the greenhouse office with the New South Wales government as well. So that was 15 years ago. And I think it's interesting what I find now is the discussions that we were having in Australia 15 years ago are sort of what we're having here in Ireland now. Um, and I think Australia unfortunately has gone a, a little bit backwards with it. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on, because uh, Natalie has done a, an excellent job of going through what nature-based solutions are um, and in the Irish context what it would mean. So I suppose for me, like how do we ensure that nature-based solutions are incorporated into what we're doing and how we address climate change? And 18 months ago, there was, um, you know, we, we made a, a huge statement, the Dáil uh, declared a climate and a biodiversity climate crisis, and that was um, on the 9th of May in 2019. And that was a really, really big statement. And what was particularly important about it was the fact that there was a dual purpose to it. It wasn't just a climate crisis, but we recognized at that point as well that biodiversity was also at a crisis point. Um, and I remember at that time thinking, this is great, but now, now what? Now what do we do? And how do we ensure that this just isn't a, a virtue signal um, and that we go on our merry way? 
Um, and unfortunately, I think what's happened is we have we've seen some progress in relation to addressing the climate crisis and ensuring that we're developing laws and policies for that. But I find biodiversity has always been left behind. It's like the poor cousin of climate change, and it's not it's not been addressed or spoken about with the same frequency or the same passion um, and the same urgency, I think, as we see with when it comes to, to the climate crisis. And even since becoming a TD um, last February, it's something that I've been trying to introduce and talk about quite a bit in the Dáil. And I find that it's uh, it doesn't really have the same impetus as, as the, the, the climate crisis. But I do think we have an opportunity now because as many of you will be aware, the Dáil is actually uh, the, the climate action and uh, low carbon development amendment bill is going through the Dáil um, at the moment or in the legislative process at the moment. And I think that is a really good opportunity for us to actually cement in the whole concept of biodiversity and nature-based solutions into how we're addressing the, uh, the climate crisis and try to, to do it that way. Um, so I, what I'm going to do actually is just go through the climate uh, bill with you just to explain what it is and how we can possibly use it to address some of the biodiversity issues we're seeing, but also how do we incorporate nature-based solutions into it in a way, as Natalie described, isn't damaging, but actually is beneficial, um, both for the climate and, and our environment. Um, so there's the, the act, uh, or the bill, sorry, this is what the bill is to do. So it's to provide uh, plans for the purpose of pursuing the transition to a climate resilient and climate neutral economy uh, by the end of the year 2050. Um, and it will do that using a climate change advisory committee, which will provide for carbon budgets and a decarbonisation target range for certain sectors. Um, so that's essentially what the bill is about. This is the process it's going through. So the heads of the bill were published on the 7th of October. Um, and currently the bill is going through what's called pre-legislative scrutiny, which means that it goes to the Oireachtas Committee on Climate Action. Um, and we and I'm, I'm one of the people on that committee um, and we bring in a series of experts such as people like Natalie, we have uh, quite a few experts in Ireland that we've brought in and internationally to talk us through the bill that's, that's before us to see how we can strengthen it, how we can make it better, what the gaps are. And I think in general, there's been quite a few gaps found in the climate bill. Uh, things like the language is, is very loose. It talks about pursuing and not achieving, you know, to say to pursue a transition rather than to achieve a transition to a low carbon economy um, and things like just transition aren't included um, but also it's very weak when it comes to the issue of nature based solutions and biodiversity and that's one thing that um, there's quite a few of us on the committee that are really keen on seeing and making sure it's incorporated. So this is the makeup of the committee so you, you'll probably recognize quite a few of the uh, TDs and senators there, it's fundamentally, it is a government controlled committee. So ultimately uh, the government will have, will, will, will decide what, what changes will come out of the committee. But interestingly, and I think what is really positive to see that there are quite a few of us who are very interested in the area of biodiversity. So I have an ecological background as does um, Lynn Boylan from Sinn Féin and Alice Mary uh, Higgins is very keen on the issue of biodiversity as well as is Christopher O'Sullivan. So there are quite a few of us on the committee that have been raising this as an issue and really do want to see this bill do something towards um, improving biodiversity um, across across the country. So once we, we actually this week we've received um, a draft, essentially a summary of all the recommendations that the experts have made to us. We're reviewing that at the moment. And once we get that, we'll, we'll put forward some recommend changes to government. Government can accept them or not. And then the bill goes through the Dáil process where there's five stages and at each stage there's essentially debates and we can put in amendments. Um, and that's an opportunity, I suppose, for people who want to engage in the process to, to have a talk with their TDs as well to see what amendments can go in at that point in time. Um, the bill itself, when it comes to uh, nature-based solutions and biodiversity, as I said, it's quite, it's quite weak when it actually, uh, when we look at exactly what they talk about. So the, the only real reference to nature-based solutions is this aspect here, which is 
is in the definition of what um, removal, greenhouse gas removal means. And it just talks about removal of gases from the Earth's atmosphere through the use of natural or technological solutions. And um, so it's not, you know, it's not very defined. It's just sort of a, 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 a bioreference really in there. Um, when it comes to biodiversity, um, the, there's two areas where it's been mentioned. One is that in the Climate Advisory Council, um, that you know th that it is possible for for the by someone with expertise in, in the area of biodiversity and uh, ecosystem services to be on the council, which is positive. But I think it needs to be strengthened strengthened quite significantly to make sure that we do have ecologists on it and not just that it is possible, you know, that they could be one of the one of the key players on the advisory council. I think it's really important that we have someone with that specific expertise that sits on that council and can advise um, as they go through all the different, um, you know, make up the plans and, and everything else. The, the other area where biodiversity is mentioned in the bill, and this is this is actually quite important, is the, the climate bill is being used to um, amend an existing bill. And that existing bill is the NORA bill, which is the National Oil Reserves Agency Act, sorry, um, Act that was passed in, um, it was amended in July. Now, when it went through the doll in July, essentially this, what, the, what this act does is it sets up a climate action fund of, um, I think it's a total of something like 500 million. So there's a lot of money that will go into this fund. And that act said how that fund was going to be spent, what areas it was going to be spent on. Um, and really it referred to um, technological solutions to climate change. So it was very much, you know, looking at electric vehicles or um, um, renewable energies, that kind of stuff. And at the time when that bill was going through, I had suggested, I, I put in a number of amendments to the minister to ensure that that money could also be made available to nature-based solutions because I think you know if you're an ecologist working in Ireland you know that there are, there's never a huge amount of money there for research or for doing work in this area and I think it's really important that if we want to start incorporating and doing something um, you know solid in this area that we're going to have to make sure that we have the research for it and that projects that actually implement nature-based solutions that there is funding available for them on a par with things like you know um, emissions reductions if, um, through electric vehicle use or wind farms or whatever else. Um, at the time, the minister didn't accept the amendments, but he has subsequently amended the bill or is, is aiming to amend the bill through the climate bill, which is really positive. And you can see there that the NORA Act will be amended to support projects that seek to increase the removal of greenhouse gas, particularly na nature-based solutions that enhance biodiversity. Now, I think that element of that what, what it says there is, is incredibly important because it's not just they're not just referring to nature-based solutions, there, it is contingent on them enhancing biodiversity. And I think that's really, really important because as Natalie said earlier on, there is a real risk that we focus on nature-based solutions and we just talk about trees, planting trees. But if those trees are planted in the wrong areas or they're the wrong type of trees, they potentially could actually do more damage um, than, than you know, good. So I, 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 the fact that, that they uh, speak about enhancing biodiversity in that aspect, of, of the, uh, the bill is really, really useful. Um, so I suppose when we're looking at, I think I've just, okay. So when it comes to then how do we actually, because this is what's in the bill at the moment. So how do we strengthen it? And we're, that's what we're looking at the moment. How do we incorporate nature-based solutions into it? And there are a number of uh, things that we can do. Um, I believe that we need a strong um, definition included in there. There's no definition for what nature-based nature solutions are. And I think when we're talking about nature-based solutions that we need to ensure that they do enhance biodiversity. Um, I think we need to include it as something that the, you know, that when they're developing plans that, that they must have regard to nature-based solutions as part of the solution uh, for this. Um, some of the experts have, have recommended that any plans that are devised um, and come out of the climate bill um, should actively support the um, biodiversity action plan. Um, and then also are the roles, you know, should we be specifying, specifying roles for local authorities in this? Because when you're dealing with biodiversity, we do need to have the overarching um, governance framework and we need to have um, a high level approach to it, but also we need to work on the ground and the local authorities I think are really well placed to do that. If we do that, we need to make sure we fund them because unfortunately what we tend to do is 
give local authorities jobs to do and then we don't give them the money to follow up on them and um, so I think you know any of this will will require support I know that um, you know even when it comes to uh, having ecologists or biodiversity herd you know officers in the councils most of them don't have biodiversity officers or you have a heritage officer that's also doubling um, as a as a um, biodiversity officers as well so we need to give them the the supports that they need um, and to ensure that the funding is there for them to do that. Um, but I think essentially, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be working on this bill, really trying to strengthen it. And what we need to do is make sure that we cement the concept um, of biodiversity enhancement and protection into how we address climate change and um, you know, how we, how we manage our adaptation, how we manage our mitigation, because it is a key component and it should be a key component. And I think it's a, you know, we're at that point in time where we have this huge opportunity to, um, to, to really have a win-win for both the climate and, and our natural environment. And I think we should use it to, to do that. Um, here's just some principles that, that I, was, I was sitting in last night that I, that I was, I, I jotted down. Again, I think, you know, when I'm, when I'm looking at the bill and what we need to do, we need to recognize the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis are intrinsically linked, that they're you know, two heads of the same coin um, and that the solutions for one are the solutions for the other. Um, and actually the, the problems of one will cause problems for the other. Um, that climate adaptation and mitigation should do no damage to our biodiversity, but should, should aim to improve it. Um, that it should be evidence-based. What I see is that when we're talking about nature-based solutions, and it was actually, it was really interesting from Natalie's presentation, because you had a lot of the facts and figures, but it's, it can be very difficult to find, you know, when you're looking at exactly what's available, uh, what potential nature-based solutions are out there, like how do you quantify it? You know, where are the areas we should be looking at? You know, have we mapped our kelp beds? Have we mapped our, our seagrass? You know, our peatlands, all that, you know, so some, when we're when we're making these decisions we we need to be basing them on evidence we need to be able to monitor them and we need to be able to measure them and um, because we won't get everything right we'll get some things wrong and i think we need to be flexible enough to if we if we can see that we're doing something that's incorrect or that's actually not having the consequences that we had hoped because you know our environment can be quite a complex system that we we are in a position to recognize it quickly and modify and change quickly as well um, and again i think you know one of the areas in the climate bill there is a real gap um, is that just transition hasn't been you know incorporated and i think when it comes to biodiversity and nature-based solutions that just transition should also be an overarching concept that we we bring in to play as well I think we will not, we, we can't address these crises by leaving a whole swathe of our community behind and not, you know, having them benefit from, from what's happening or being further disadvantaged by what's happening. Um, when it comes to challenges with something like this, um, I think, you know, as, as Natalie said, if, if we focus solely on carbon capture and we don't take a more holistic view, both from a carbon perspective and a biodiversity perspective, we could actually um, do more damage than, than, than we um, do good. I think coming from someone who's worked in this area um, for quite a while, I think our speed of implementation is it, it, like, we're too slow. We are way too slow when we're trying to address these issues. And I think, I don't know why that is, but we, we can, like, if I look back to, I think it's probably three or four years ago, I started talking about getting two electric vehicle chargers in in, the, in, in, the, in Wicklow, in one of the districts, and they're still not in place, you know. So if we're going to address these crises, we need to do it quickly. There needs to be urgency in it. Um, we, we do have a lack of baseline information and research, and I would really hope that the monies that are set aside in that NORA bill will actually facilitate that research, because if we don't know where our starting point is, we won't be able to identify what our endpoint wants to be, and we won't be able to see whether or not we're meeting those targets. So I think that's really important. Um, the silo of policy development. Uh, so again, I think even, ha uh, even how biodiversity, where it's placed in our government structures and climate change, we have, you know, a, a department of uh, that deals with climate and environment, and then our biodiversity is over in the Department of Housing. And I think that that 
makes it more difficult for a, a sort of coordinated and a coherent approach to these things. So, I mean, my preference would be that, that biodiversity will be included in the Department of Environment, but hopefully that we can really sort of push for, for um, engagement and cross cooperation in, in between those portfolios. I think dealing with this will require a cultural um, and mindset shift. I think traditionally we're very much, um, uh, you know, if, if we have an issue with flooding, for example, the first thing we do is point to our local engineer who will go get, you know, start building walls or things like that. And I think we've really lost our trust and our connection with nature and our faith in nature. And I think we're going to have to try to reestablish that. I think, you know, rather than going for the engineering solutions to actually put our faith in, you know, upstream management of our rivers um, and to ensure that that's actually the, you know, how, how we're going to try focus on these things. So I think there will be a cultural shift that's required. Um, and then there's lack of enforcement of accountability, which is which is a problem. And I think that's something that um, if we do have a strong climate uh, bill or act in place eventually, um, that will facilitate and ensure that there is an ability to enforce these things, you know, but I think we may need to even go further than that at some stage um, to enable to enable that accountability to, to happen. Um, so look, that that's essentially it. I, I just had put this in, but I think you know, Natalie, you'd you'd pretty much covered it. But so if we're looking at trees, we're talking about the right trees in the right places. And I'm sure many of the people out there who are looking at this have seen the awful videos that have come from Donegal and from um, Curry over the last few days, where you would essentially see trees flowing, um, you know, on 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 our bogs because of the, they were planted in the wrong place. Um, and there's you know, when we when we talk about climate, we can, we have you know the sequestration of carbon storage, but the, look at the, the advantages of trees in the right place, um, you know, are, are absolutely used. And I really don't think we can afford to give up the opportunity uh, that we have at the moment to address our biodiversity loss uh, through this mechanism. Um, I, I'll just finish up by saying that when we talk about nature-based solutions, we do talk about them, you know, this presentations about them in relation to climate change. But really, nature-based solutions are there. Like there's nature-based solutions for our mental health, nature-based solutions for our physical health, nature-based solutions for our communities. Like really, all we need to do is support nature in doing its thing because it knows what to do. And if we give it the time and the space uh, to do it, it, it will recalibrate. It will it will settle itself. But we just need to support it to do it. So that's uh, over over to you, Porig. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Jennifer. That was uh, that was really really good. I mean, it's really good to know that um, there are people like you in the in the committee in the Dáil who are raising these issues where they need to be raised. Uh, and uh, and I think we all share your frustration at the lack of urgency on this uh, this situation. I mean, many people uh, in in the activist realm have been talking about these things for you know many many years, and uh, we've I think we've yet to see that level of urgency translate. Um, uh, in Ireland. Um, I also really liked your last point as well and um, Natalie some of the things I've read from from your sources as well as from the IUCN are that um, nature-based solutions are for what are called societal challenges. I mean they help with water quality and flooding and adaptation and food production and so there's all these this array of different benefits uh, to working with nature. But a question for you Natalie, I mean ultimately in terms of just uh, climate change and meeting our goals under the Paris Agreement, we're going to have to measure these things. And uh, I'm just wondering, are there accepted ways of, I mean, I mean the thing I, I know from conversations I've had about peatlands in Ireland, it can be complicated to calculate the carbon storage and absorption, never mind the oceans or something like that. I mean, can we put numbers on these things? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great question. Um, I think actually um, carbon is one of the more easy, more straightforward things to quantify from ecosystems. That's not to say that there aren't some technical challenges um, around the need to do it repeatedly, that the seasonal variation. So you need to, you know, you know, calc you know, make the calculations as they vary in space and time. But it actually, um, carbon is relatively straightforward to measure both above ground and below ground, um, I would say. But when it comes to measuring adaptation and biodiversity benefits, you know, nature based solutions deliver for all of these things, measuring those present more, more, cha more, more challenges, in fact, because adaptation you can measure 
for example, benefits in terms of reducing our exposure to the impacts of climate change by measuring, for example, how much the energy in waves is attenuated or reduced by the presence of, you know, the physical structures of the habitat. But adaptation to climate change also involves building resilience in societies. And, and there you've got um, really interesting uh, evidence from across the world that the sheer process of being involved with restoring nature, with restoring ecosystems, builds social capital, builds bonds within and between communities and actually makes those communities a lot more resilient to the impacts of climate change in future and other and other stresses. So that's important to think about adaptation in terms of you know how it's how it's affecting society and building resilience. And then of course you've got to you know think about you know, benefits for whom. So you might be able to measure socioeconomic benefits for certain parts of the community, but you've got to look at the community as a whole and you've got to think about future generations. And so all those things, they are, there are lots of really, um, you know, great groups of researchers and practitioners across the globe who are collecting data on these more nuanced, abs nuanced abstracts. And we are building up a be better methodologies around how we both you know, count, account for some of the you know, adaptation benefits. When it comes to biodiversity, of course, for people, I mean, um, when it comes to biodiversity, of course, there are methods of measuring the amount of you know, species richness in the soils and in our ecosystems, but it's important to have, again, a, a more comprehensive measurement. So not just look at the, for example, the number of bird species, but again, get into the soil and look at the soil microbe diversity and I think really really glad uh, Jennifer that you highlighted the importance of research I think sometimes people are so and funders are so keen to get on with the implementation that they sometimes overlook the importance of that research piece because actually we don't know quite enough yet about where the real hot spots are in terms of biodiversity carbon and adaptation we do need to do that comprehensive mapping to, to find out where that where where those multiple benefits can be delivered and then we need to get systems of monitoring and evaluation in place so that we can show that those you know where and how those benefits can be delivered over time so i think that's really really important not to overlook that because um although we know that there are all these benefits there's importance you know the devil is always in the detail and often what works in one area might not work in another so we need to like set up set up the system so that we can map that and track that over time and um natalie are you aware of other countries that have successfully in, integrated nature-based solutions into their climate legislation well, yes, a number of countries. I mean, we're, the, the world is often uh, looking at Costa Rica that's done an incredible job in terms of not only renewable energy, I mean, almost all of its energy now comes from renewable sector, but has also mainstreamed uh, the protection restoration of its ecosystems. And there's a lot of legislation around um, the need to maintain or offset any damage to ecosystems and actively restore. So I think that that's a country which which has got lots of good examples, but there are, there are many. It's actually very interesting way and analyze the, the nationally determined contribution which are the climate pledges associated with the Paris Agreement. And actually it turns out that 66% um, of um, those nationally determined contributions actually do include nature-based solutions um, for mitigation and or adaptation. So there's, but there's, a lot of, but there's a lot of high level commitment and actually very few have then got the, you know, the, the specific tar evidence-based targets and action plans and, and crucially also the plan for funding. So, so actually I would say that you know, most countries are lacking on that bit, even though many countries now are recognizing the importance of working with nature, not just for nature's sake, but for all of our sakes and recognizing that we are part of nature and, and, and but then we all need to do the work to ensure that they, you know, they, they follow up on that with actual robust verifiable actions on the ground. Is it advancing in the UK? I mean, I think you have a pretty decent climate law, if, uh, if I'm right in saying. It is advancing in the UK, but again, you know, we have ambitious net zero plans, but actually there's there needs to be much more rigour around, um, you know, the difference, for example, between BECS, which is bioenergy capture and carbon storage. So that's the that's the planting of monoculture crops to draw down the carbon. Um, and then that gets burnt and, and the carbon dioxide gets locked up locally. But unfortunately, you know, in order to scale up something like BEX, that's going to come at the cost of biodiverse ecosystems, of food production, so on. So it isn't really a climate solution. So although we have these sort of you know high level plans and that ambition around net zero, the pathways to net zero could be more or less good for biodiversity. And, and a lot of work now um, is in place with lots of different organisations, research organisations, and practitioners across the UK to try and ensure that as we get to net zero, we do it in a way that supports flourishing and healthy ecosystems and therefore people. 
Thanks so much, uh, Natalie. I know you're you're racing off uh, to do a school run, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll take the chance before I move on to another question to thank you for uh, for uh, uh, your talk today. I think it's been really really wonderful to to have you here and to uh, for you to share your your knowledge and your wisdom with us. So thank you again. Um, but we're not just done yet, folks. Um, um, I have a, couple, a lot of questions coming in here about um, financing. And uh, maybe Jennifer, I'll put this to you. There's a, there's there's kind of we, we hear terms like offsetting and natural capital, uh, carbon farming, and just transition. I mean, are there how are, how are we going to finance this? Is this all to do with incentives and penalties on on end users, or how is this going to work? Do you think? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. I would imagine it'll be a jigsaw of approaches. Um, for starters, I would hope that the Climate Action Fund under the Nora Bill could be a good starting point for financing and, and funding um, research, but also the implementation of projects, you know, and I think that would be a, a really good starting point. And I know that they are, they've already funded some projects that had been initiated from last year, um, and there's going to be another funding round uh, at the end of this year. And I think it's important because all the previous money that went out went to more technological approaches. Um, and I would really like to see some nature-based um, solutions incorporated into the funding model this time. So I do think you know, that, 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 we, um, that we do need to start recognizing the importance of it and putting the money there to support it. Um, I would hope that there'll be money coming from the EU um, in relation to the EU Green Deal and the biodiversity strategy. You know, at the moment they're um, they're sort of they're they're planning out the framework for that, um, and and you know some of the things that they're they're mentioning. Um, if we could get funding to implement some of those projects here, I think it would be really really useful. You know, um, and I think that 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 will be an area that I would really like to see us see if we can draw down some some of that uh, those supports when it comes to just transition. Um, that was a really weak area in the bill that we're, um, that's just going through at the moment. I mean, it wasn't even mentioned. Um, there was no definition. See you, Natalie, bye. Thanks again. Um, there, was no, there was no definition for just transition um, in there. And I think it's important that we not only have that definition, but we also, I mean, Scotland have done a really good job actually of incorporating just transition and, and to ensure that there's a fairness with how we, we do transition to a low carbon economy. Um, we had some we had some experts in talking about just transition and what I found really interesting is that they were saying well we don't have we don't know what policies and what we you know we don't we haven't really fleshed out how we would do it um, and I think it's important that um, I think it's important that that work gets gets happening now there are plans for just transition commission and um, that will look at all that stuff so I, I, you know I think what I'd really like to see and I did I did mention it um, during the discussions that, that we actually need to start developing those policies now. And I think there needs to be a, a recognition that there are some people who will not be able to um, uh, transition easily, you know, that, they're, uh, that, that the cost of it will just be too, too prohibitive for them. Um, and we need to ensure that those people are supported to, to, uh, to, make, that, to make that change in however, um, uh, whatever way we do and it was interesting I, I can't remember we had a, we had a really fascinating uh, presentation last week it was a, a professor from the UK and he just pointed out he said look when you when you look at who's admitting who's responsible for these emissions he said it is not the people who can't afford to transition like the people um, in, in low pay jobs are not responsible for high emissions he said it's people like us it's people like us who hop on a plane two or three times a year to go on holidays or who travel uh, who have two or three cars in their household who have large households large carbon footprints um, so he said the reality is you know that it's, it's people like us who 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 need to be targeted when it comes to ensuring that uh, that we're managing our, our climate emissions um, and not not people on low paid jobs um, and I think it's going to be really important as we go through the next few phases of this is that we listen to people's voices as well. So I know um, there recently there was a policy launched, a waste, waste policy was launched and I was really surprised because they were talking at that stage about cutting out, you know, two for one meal deals, that kind of stuff. Um, and I was really surprised that actually that no one who 
was at risk of poverty or no one really from the from the grassroots disability sector had been consulted in that policy there was a stakeholder advisory group that had something like 40 different organizations on it but there was no one who could really talk for the people who will be most impacted by it and i think that's going to be really important that as we as we go through this process as we roll this out we need to listen to people because um, you know, we need to we need to hear their experiences and their concerns and and ensure that we that we really can't afford to leave anyone behind because, um, you know, I mean, it, it needs to be for all of us when, when, we, when we do this. Um, it's, I, th I think we'd all agree with that, uh, Jennifer. I know from my experience in the Midlands, you know, I do have seen a lot of eye rolling at the mention of the term just transition. Um, and a lot of people haven't seen it uh, on the ground, but um, in other areas uh, away from peatlands, I mean, do you think a just transition is um, could be applied to, let's say, areas of the fishing industry or parts of farming and, and other kinds of land use? Is that yeah. considered? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, what we need to do is really we just need to start thinking outside the box, right? We've, we've, we've sort of, we've gone down a road where we've industrialized an awful lot of our activities. So whether it's our farming or our fishing, right? So it's, all, it, it's the big players, I think, tend to make a do well out of those situations. And the smaller players are continually forced into a situation where um, they have to uh, be more efficient, more productive, you know, it, it sort of it's, it takes them away, I think, from their original starting point of why they would have gotten into fishing or farming, you know. Um, and I think that if you look at if you look at fishing, I mean, if you look at the East Coast, you know, I mean, it's pretty much dead. When I, I used to go out on them, um, when I worked for the Marine Institute, I used to go out on a lot of uh, research boats and I'd hang around Hoth and hop on whatever boat came in and go out for a week with them. Um, and like this was, you know, 15, 16 years ago, and even back then, because um, I was studying cod and so I'd ask could I go out and go cod fishing and they'd literally roll around laughing at me because they were saying like there is no cod out there and we'd go out and we could be fishing for two or three days and you could get maybe you know a box of cod um, and, and so like things haven't improved so there, there are many many opportunities but we just need to give our resources and our, our landscape a time to recover and what I found absolutely astounding, and I don't know if it's because of lockdown or because we're a lot more connected on the web, but I can never remember there being as many whales and dolphins and just amazing sights of whale sharks and, you know, off the West Coast. It, it's been like last year was just incredible and the most beautiful uh, videos up online. And if we had if we had opportunities like that, there, there's a that, that's a whole new industry that will be available like a tourism sector that will be available to us and that actually could provide jobs in those areas where people can still retain that sense and connection to the coast and to the marine you know because like I like my you know like I come from a fishing family so I know how it, it's sort of in your blood you know you're, you're very very connected to it and um, and I think that that would still enable those people to stay connected to what they love um, and what's in their, their their history and their tradition, but just doing it in a more sustainable way, you know, so. Very good. Um, I just, it's after three o'clock, so we just take one more question. Um, and maybe it's not so much a question, but I see it coming up a lot in the Q&A and the chat. Um, is uh, the, the curse of Sitka spruce that we live with. I mean, how are we going to get away from planting lines of pines, do you think? You, you know what I'd love? I don't know if it's ever been, I don't, Don, you, you'd probably be able to tell me, but I'd love to know how much it costs us to subsidize those. About planting. 100 million a year. Is that what it is? So yeah. like, we need to decide what we're gonna spend our money on. You know, like we have, you know, that we have a bucket of money in the country if we're going to spend money subsidizing some industries or people to do certain things like what is it that we're going to subsidize and we need to make a decision that we're subsidizing something that will actually add value not just value to that individual because they can make money from it but actually value to our environment and and value to our communities um, and I, you know that's the decision we're, we're now that the point where we're now at like why are we subsidizing something that is just going to cause um environmental degradation and costs us a lot more down the road it just it just doesn't make sense to me you know so but then it comes down to how do we quantify these things you know and, and i think sometimes the information is lacking and the mapping's lack, lacking and the research is lacking so it's you know sort of coming back to the the, the scientists and me i like having all the data um, and then making your decisions on that you know and i think we do need to start quantifying 
how much is this costing us? How much is it costing down the road to all the, you know, with all the damage that's been caused? And is, is this where we want to spend our money? Because I think if we were to spell it out like that, I think we would decide actually, no, we, there, there's more um, better, better value ways of, of using our, our, our money, you know? Yeah, very good. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that point is applicable to farming and peatlands and fishing as well and, and other, other activities. But um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, Jennifer, thanks very much for your time. Uh, it's really been great to, to have you here. A lot of comments in the chat, you know, saying how wonderful you are and how great it is to have uh, people with, with your expertise and your passion uh, in the doll. Uh, and I, I, would, uh, I would second that. Um, and thank you everybody for tuning in. We got an excellent attendance today and I'm really delighted uh, to see the level of interest in it. Just to reiterate that this talk will be on our YouTube channel probably later in the week. Uh, we will post a link to it on our social media channel when it is available. Uh, just a reminder as well that if you want to support the Irish Wildlife Trust, please do consider uh, joining up uh, and becoming a member and you will get a copy of our magazine every three months and uh, you will get to stay in touch with all, all our comings and goings. And it makes a great gift for Christmas, just saying. Um, so once again, thanks very much.